Now, taking it a stage further, share exchange and reorganisation relief. Well, the basic concept is easy, isn't it? Everybody knows this. You swap shares in company A for shares in company B, there's no disposal. Please, please remember two things. Thing number one is that it is possible for the Inland Revenue to deny this treatment if they believe that the transaction has been undertaken for non bona fide commercial purposes and for the avoidance of corporation tax or capital gains tax. That has not always been the case. One of the most famous tax cases is a case called Furness and Dawson, one of the leading tax cases of the early 1980s which developed the so-called new approach. What did Mr Dawson do? He did something very straightforward. He was going to sell his company and he realised that if, instead of selling his company to the purchaser, he did a swift share exchange so that he then had shares in an Isle of Man company rather than shares in his company, and the Isle of Man company sold the shares in his company to the purchaser, lo and behold, that rather awkward capital gains tax bill seemed to disappear to nothing. So he did something which absolutely was legal and legitimate, but the revenue said this is outrageous tax avoidance, under the new approach that we are developing in conjunction with Lord Wilberforce and, and uh, some of his colleagues in the House of Lords, we are going to attack this because we think all you've done is inserted a step with no commercial purpose other than tax avoidance and we think the courts will strike it down and they did. But as a consequence of that, it is now necessary for you to satisfy the revenue that there isn't a tax avoidance motive. But there is a clearance procedure. So you can write to the revenue, tell them what you're going to do, why you're going to do it, and you will get your clearance. In the same way that if you transfer your properties to a company under Section 162, you get an uplift at the company level for CGT purposes, you do the same thing here. The shares in Company A that are now owned by Company B, Company B is deemed to have acquired them at market value. So if Company B were to sell them, Provided you can convince the revenue that it was never the original plan and you, it, it, was, you know, it was done for bona fide reasons and something changed so that a year later a purchaser came along, you should be able to walk round again. If you, but, I mean, it depends on the circumstances. The crucial issue, I think, is, is A, getting the revenue clearance, and having done that, dealing with some stamp duty points. Because people always think, oh, well, if it works for capital gains tax, if it works for corporation tax, stamp duty must be all right. It can't be as liability as stamp duty. It must be all right. And they're wrong. There is a specific exemption from stamp duty under Section 77 of the 86 Finance Act in respect of which you need to have identical shareholders before and after the transaction. Often you will find you do not have that. But often you find that if you do a bit of pre-deal planning, you can arrange it. So capital gains tax, the share exchange relief, um, fairly easy one, but well known. Now, two minutes to rattle through a few points here. Main residence relief. The point here is a very simple one. If you own a main residence, it's capital gains tax exempt. If you have more than one residence, you can elect for which is to be deemed to be your main residence for this purpose. Now, what's the purpose of that election? The election does not deem something which is not a residence to be a residence. It deems something which is a residence but which may not be your main residence to be your main residence. It needs to be a residence before you can make this election. And why would you bother making the election? You make the election for two reasons. Reason number one is that having made the election, you can chop and change. It gives you superb flexibility. Whereas if you don't make the election within two years of having a second residence, you can't then make it. Although you can remedy the position by acquiring a third residence. Now, getting a third residence will start the, start the ball rolling again. So it gives you flexibility. But the last 36 months rule is that if any residence has been your main residence, 
the last 36 months of ownership are exempt in any event. So by nominating an e a residence, which isn't really your main residence, to be your main residence for a very short period of time, buys you not only that short period of time, but the last 36 months of ownership. It is a crucial that you do it, crucial that you do it. The Rules are extended to trusts. Trustees can get this. And I'll give you a very, very easy example of this. Very easy example, very personal example. I've just bought my daughter a flat. My daughter, do I trust her? Absolutely. But do I trust her with my money? Absolutely not. Um, so what did I do? I created a trust. Very easy to do, because I've got a trust deed. I can knock them out like shelling peas, it is for me. Um, who are the trustees? Well, I'm one of them. My friend is the other one. Who is the person who has the life interest? It is my daughter. How much money do I put into this trust? 100 quid. I then lent the trust the remainder of the money to buy the flat in question. So I am protected from my daughter's um, creditors and predators, shall we say, in two ways. Way number one is she doesn't own the property, the trust does. But way number two is the trust only owns it because there's a loan to me as well, so I've got a loan and a trust in the way, which is quite good. But the important thing is this, if that property goes up in value, it will be capital gains tax exempt. If I owned it personally, it wouldn't be, because it's not my residence. But at the trust level, the trustees can claim main residence relief because it is the main residence of the person entitled to occupy under the terms of the trust. The trustees get main residence relief because my daughter uses it as a main residence. I commend it. I commend it to the house. Trusts, good stuff. Large gardens. Large gardens, very difficult. If there is a golden rule, it is this. If you are going to carve up part of your garden and sell it off with development potential, for God's sake, following the precedent in a case called Vartian Lines, sell the garden first, sell the house second. The taxpayer in Vartian Lines, Mr Lines I suppose it was, did it the other way around. He had a garden, divided it, sold the house, some months later sold the garden off, claimed main residence relief on the garden, and the revenue said, uh, no mate, because it is no longer part of your residence. You have done it the wrong way around. So very, very interesting point. If you have got large gardens, um, the permitted area for a garden is half a hectare, which is about 1.2 acres, um, or such larger area as is reasonably required for the enjoyment of the property. If you've got a large garden, please, please make sure that you record the fact that you need it, what you do with it, take photographs of all the glorious flower beds. Do not have it as a paddock with a pony in, so it's not really part of the garden. You will not get main residence exemption on that. <laughs>